Oh. Good morning. Welcome to Alive Wesleyan Church. We are so glad you are here this morning. Uh, we started with a few announcements here. Uh, first off, this morning, uh, just to remind you that tonight at 5:30 p.m. we have youth group led by Pastor Cam, and I encourage you to come on out for that. On Tuesday, we have our normal uh, Women Inspired by God at 10 a.m. Hopefully, it won't be as cold as it is today. It's a little windy out there for everybody, uh, but. We'll hope for better weather the rest of this week. Wednesday at 8.30 a.m., the Woven Women are having a prayer time in the sanctuary. And Wednesday at 5.15, one of the community church organizations we are part of is having a Lenten soup in scriptures at Kirkville United Methodist Church. I encourage you to be a part of that. Wednesday at 6.30, we have our prayer and Bible study time and our discovery club. And on Saturday of this week, uh, at 10 a.m., the Woven Women are having a Hello Spring brunch. So bring a friend. It's going to be an exciting time for the ladies of Sister Fellowship. And if you can see in the poster in the overflow room for more details. Uh, just a reminder that we have uh, a food pantry that we support in our church, the Filer Road Food Pantry. And I encourage you to bring donations and put them in the box over there. We are one of, I believe, two churches that help support them and fill their pantry. So let's make sure to support that. A couple of things coming up here. Uh, the annual spring cleanup is happening on Saturday, May 6th. I know it's hard to believe that spring is coming, but it's coming. Uh, might be coming slow, but it's coming. So if you're interested in that, it's going to be from 9 to 11 a.m., uh, but we encourage you to sign up for that. Uh, talk to Mark uh, Boswell for more details. We're going to be also having an Easter egg hunt in April. On April 8th, Saturday, April 8th at 10 a.m., uh, the fellowship team is putting together an Easter egg hunt. And you can see in the insert, in the bulletin, and in the overflow room for more information on that. Uh, coming, with, coming up to Easter here, we are starting to get our Easter plans together. And on Easter Sunday, we're going to be doing things a little different. We're not going to be having one service. We're going to have our normal two services. Uh, and we're not going to be having an Easter breakfast as we've had in the past, but we will be having a special refreshment time uh, with some extra refreshments in between uh, the first and second service. So encourage you to come on out for that Easter Sunday and enjoy the special refreshments that Sunday. So uh, with that, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up here, and I'm going to call us into a time of worship. Would you stand? Father, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to come before you and to recognize you are the Lord over our life. And we thank you for that. We thank you and we glorify you, lifting your name above every other name. And so this morning, as we praise you, as we lift up our songs to you, would you be glorified? Would your name be lifted up above every other name? We receive all the glory and the honor and the power. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What a great time to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Let's lift up his name high in praise this morning and let those praises just rise all the way to the heavens. Glory of 
among us. Let the joy of the King rise among us. Let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Oh, let it rise. Amen. The children can be dismissed for Sunday school at this time.
We're going to introduce a new song right now. Death was arrested. I'm sure if you've listened to K-Love or Family Life, you've heard this song over and over again. Been coming up into the Easter season. This is just such a beautiful song about the sacrifice that he made for us and how he rose again and saved us.
you are our Messiah. During this time, if you have praises, if you have prayer requests, the jar is here, the altar is open. Come bring your worries, your praise to him this morning.
Oh, this morning, if there's any prayer requests that you would have or any praises that you would like to give, we'd love to hear from you, our church family, and just share in that, because God is good. Yeah, scale. I have a major praise, the shot that I received in my spine. I'm feeling fantastic. So praise the Lord. Praise Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Other praises or prayers this morning? Yes, Sue. Um, I just want to praise God. Um, my sister is home as of Tuesday from the nursing home. And it's adjustment going back to the home. Of course, they're going to expect her to move along. Mm -hmm. So I just want continued prayer for her um, just to cooperate and do what she needs to do <laughs> to get better. Thank Sounds you good. for all your prayers. Of course. Praise the Lord that she's home. Yeah. Amen. Pastor Leary? Yeah, uh, just continued prayer for Sharon Her Hager. Uh, she's uh, traveling the countryside, uh, was in California. And um, I believe she's now in Arizona. So just prayers as she meets and has good conversations with family and safety and travel. Definitely be lifting up Sharon and all her travel. And if she's listening online, we love you. For your church family. <laughs> yes, Eva. Mark and I had so much fun yesterday. We went out to Mexico and um, visited a young couple, but we ended up at a restaurant, a little hole in the wall, and we got to have a Bible study there, talked about the precious mercies, new mercies every morning of God, and it happened to be a bakery, which God used as an illustration, which was wonderful. He's so cool. And then a couple uh, group came inside who were from the church out in Mexico, and I kind of overheard them talking and interrupted their conversation, asked if we could pray with them. We were so excited. We got to pray together and just praying that God would move in that place, not as a ripple of water where the, the waves kind of fade, but as a burning fire that would continue a revival in that area. So pray for Believer's Chapel North. They're having stuff for kids right now. I'm praying for them. And the food was good, too. <laughs> um, I just want to praise Charlene and the rest of the church family that came together to um, get donations, diapers, and books, and blankets together for my sister-in-law, who um, is just having a very difficult time right now. She just had a newborn. She's got a baby and just had another newborn um, baby. But for her to receive those donations and to see that there are people out there that she doesn't even know that truly care about her and that pray for her, that really lifted her spirit. So mm -hmm. um, I just want to praise God for Charlene and for everybody else that came together to make that happen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Penelope. Let's continue to pray for Carol Bellows and the Dorians um, mm -hmm. with uh, Claudia having bronchitis and Gary it's been extremely difficult to care for their mom and yeah. uh, their caregiver uh, schedule was disrupted this week mm -hmm. and we hope that things can improve for them this coming week. Definitely we'll be lifting up the Dorians. It's Joe. It's weird to see you on that side. I'm used to you on this side. <laughs> I just wanted to thank the church family and everybody for the continued prayers and uh, cards for John. Uh, praise John is doing uh, really well he's starting to come around and be himself he even said when he comes home he wants to start playing the guitar for the church again hmm. praise the Lord but uh, he's doing good he should be home next week and uh, just continued prayers Amen. we'll continue to lift him up other prayers or praises this morning Any unspokens? Yeah, I'm getting the hang of this now. See, I can. So what happens if everybody's got an unspoken here? We don't even have to say it, right? It's spoken. 
definitely be lifting you up in all the things that you need. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you for the way that you are working alive, Wesleyan Church, through our church family. And Lord, we give you the praise, we give you the glory for all that you have done in our lives. And this morning, um, we do, we thank you for how you're working in Gail's life. We thank you that after this treatment that she's been able to uh, feel good and uh, Lord, we pray that you would continue to strengthen her. Would you bless her with the strength and uh, just the, the peace that she needs to get through every day and, and the way that you're working uh, in her spine, Lord, we just pray, would you bless her? Would you keep her? And Lord, this morning, uh, we lift up uh, and praise you for Susa Grace's sister coming home. Uh, we just pray that you would help her with the adjustment of coming uh, back home and, and help her with uh, all of the care that she will need. And uh, would you provide the resources and the right, right people to come in and help. And uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, she's no longer having to be in the nursing facility, but that she is able to be at home. And Lord, we do continue to pray for Sharon as she travels. Lord, would you work in Sharon's life? Would you bless her through this trip and uh, pray that as she travels, you would keep her safe? Uh, would this just be a good time of refreshment as she goes to see family and, and friends? And, and Lord, I just pray that you would just bless her. Would she know uh, that her alive Wesleyan Church family is praying for her and lifting her up every day? And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the way you are working in Sharon's life. And Lord, we also thank you for this encounter that Eva had yesterday and Mark with um, these individuals in this uh, cafe and, and uh, from Believer's Chapel North. And I, I, I do pray that the churches of our area would be blessed in their ministries as they pursue you. Would we realize uh, we are all pursuing one kingdom, your kingdom. Would your name be lifted above every other? And we, we do lift up this uh, children's aspect that they have some type of outreach or something. Uh, would you bless this aspect of their ministry, uh, would you work in it? And Lord, we just thank you for the way you've worked there. And Lord, we thank you for the way you're working in our church family here. Uh, as Sierra, uh, thank the church family, Lord, we, we praise you is out of your abundance and provision that we give out of. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that you would bless Sierra's sister-in-law. Would she be uh, truly ministered through uh, these gifts that Shar and other ladies have given. And so, uh, Lord, would you bless her. And Lord, we do lift up uh, Carol Bellows and, and Claudia and Gary Dorian. Lord, this morning we lift them up and we ask, Lord, would you work in their life? Uh, Lord, is, uh, Claudia is facing sickness. And, and, and Lord, we just ask, would you help her? Would you strengthen her? Would she be able to overcome this quickly? And would they have the help they need uh, with Claudia's mom, Carol, and, and would you just be in the midst there? I know they're going through a challenging time. Would you bless them? Would your spirit sustain them today? And Lord, I think of uh, Joe's praise and, and prayer for, for John. Lord, we do thank you. Uh, as Pastor Cam and I visited him this week, we thank you for the opportunity to see him and, and to connect with him and just uh, to care for him coming from his church family. And, and Lord, I do pray that you would bless John, would you encourage him? Would you uh, remind him of your goodness and faithfulness to him? And this morning I pray even, uh, would you just bless him uh, in the hospital? Lord, we pray he can come home soon, uh, that everything would be well, and uh, just pray that you would encourage him during this time. And Lord, I lift up, uh, I also think of uh, Roger Tertura as he's in the hospital, and uh, Lord, we just lift him up. Would you work in his life and would you bless him would you uh, continue to be with him uh, lord would you work in uh, helen and roger's life uh, actually as i think about it now i think he actually is home uh, I, I can't remember exactly but i remember they cauterized uh, the bleeding this week and i pray that you would continually help him uh, would you help him to be strengthened and uh, to be with us and and with our church family even today and uh Lord, I, I pray uh, for your hand at work in our church family. Lord, there was many unspoken requests that we had this morning that we were lifting up to give into your hands. And Lord, we trust you 
with the unspoken. So we trust you in the ways that only you can move. And so, Lord, I pray that you would bless those who have these requests. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and faithfulness to us. Lord, we pray today, would you bless your word? Would we hear from heaven? Would we hear from your word as we read from Exodus chapter 16? Would you speak to us about our daily provision, about our daily bread? What is it? And how do we use it? utilize and, and to get out of our darkness to see your light. And we ask that you would help us to break open the bread of life, your word, to hear from it today. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're continuing our Out of Darkness series and we're going to be in Exodus chapter 16, verses 1 through 18. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to be turning there. And we've, we've jumped ahead a little bit from where we were talking about the ten plagues. And this morning we're going to be talking about how the way God provides. We're looking at the manna and the quail this morning. And in Exodus 16, is, as many of you know, what happened before this was they do escape Pharaoh's control in a miraculous way. God delivers them through the ten plagues and carries them out of the desert and then helps them through the Red Sea. They go through it on dry land. These miracles, they set them free. But then the people begin to start their journey in the desert. And this is where things start to kind of go downhill for them. And um, In many ways, it's as we think about Exodus, there's this aspect of complaining that begins to happen as God provides for them. And this complaining becomes a constant repetition for the people of God. But we're going to see today how even when we struggle to understand Him through our grumblings, God provides for us. God sustains us. And so we need to remember this morning that God refreshes them day by day through the manna or this miraculous bread that comes from heaven. And so let's read about that. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 18. Exodus 16, 1 through 18. The whole Israelite community set out from Elam and came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai. On the fifteenth day of the second month after they had come out of Egypt, in the desert the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into this desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, In the evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, and in the morning you will see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that you should grumble against us? Moses also said. You will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him who are we you are not grumbling against us but against the lord then moses told aaron say to the entire israelite community come before the lord for he has heard your grumbling while aaron was speaking to the whole israelite community they looked toward the desert and there was the glory of the lord appearing in the cloud The Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumblings of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat me, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am the Lord your God. That evening quail came and covered the camp, and in the morning there was a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is it? for they did not know what it was. Moses said to them, It is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Everyone is to gather as much as they need. Take an omer for each person you have in your tent. 
The Israelites did as they were told. Some gathered much, some little. And when they measured it by the omer, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. Everyone has gathered just as much as they needed. Let's pray. Father, would you speak through your word this morning? Would your word come alive in our hearts? Will we hear from heaven your word, the words of life from the bread of life that you have given us? Lord, today we ask, would you bless this word? In Jesus' name, amen. Now, in this passage, there's a few key characteristics that we can observe about God and Moses and the Israelites. God, first of all, has provided miracles that has happened in Egypt. It's provided miracles through plagues on their enemies and provided a way through the sea that was dry. God has shown them His provision. He's provided them with a leader, with Moses. And even when they get through the Red Sea, they're praising God. They're declaring His glory. In in Exodus chapter 15, there's a whole song by Moses and Miriam about how great God is. It ends in verse 11 there. Who among the gods is like you, Lord? Who is like you? Majestic in holiness, awesome in glory, working wonders. That's Exodus 15, 11. He's this amazing God who has delivered them. But after praising God, after declaring all the glory about who God is, a mere month passes since the deliverance from the hands of Pharaoh. And this had to be fresh on their minds. It had to be fresh in what they were thinking. The how God had delivered them from destruction, from their enslavement. I mean, here they are crying out to God. And even before this passage on manna and quail comes a grumbling about bad tasting water. I mean, this bitter water, the waters of Mara. And in this passage here, It just seems like there's a turn that is happening in the people of Israel. You know, before they're they're getting upset. You know, the water doesn't taste good. And here now they're saying there's not enough food. You know, people are easy to make unhappy. I I don't know about you, but it's it's pretty easy to make people unhappy. Uh, No food, bad water would make anyone irritable, right? (laughs) Some of you... Uh, You like different types of water, probably purified water or spring water or some even like well water. I don't know why. Uh, (laughs) Some people I know who who, who love it. Uh, But (laughs) uh, people are easy to make unhappy by their preferences. But let's remember something about the size of this group that is moving here. We're not talking about a group of 100 people like our church or something like that, moving around, you know, going together. Well, everybody has their own different wants and likes. This was about 600,000 men. Men, we're talking about, that's in the wilderness here. Plus their wives and children. If you you look at uh, the scriptures, the commentators estimate it could have been 2 million people traveling. That's a lot of people trying to make happy and keep content in the wilderness. And, uh, the largest church I've been to was actually last, uh, was it last week that we were down in Orlando, and we, we went to this church for this conference, and it's a church that could host, a, a, there were 6,000 people in attendance for this conference, and this, they're filling this sanctuary there, and I'm like, I, I could not imagine leading a church like this with 6,000 people, and here Moses is having to lead 600,000 men, and all their wives and children, two million. And, and to get an idea of how many people this is, even, even beyond that, uh, imagine if you took the cities of Buffalo, Rochester, and Syracuse, if you added those together, that's about 600,000 people. So there's your men. Now if you take upstate New York, you know, cut off New York City, you know, we don't need that. Um, <laughs> if you take upstate New York, 
It's about 6 million people. So imagine a third of the upstate of New York is traveling. That's what's happening here in the desert. Trying to help these people through the desert to meet with God. To become this great and powerful nation. Yeah, I'll take 100 people (laughs) in a church rather than... Two million. Uh, I don't know how Moses had the stamina or God has the patience. But this aspect here is in the, the wilderness as they're going out, as they're heading towards Sinai. Notice in verse 16, 3, the words they use. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt. There we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you have brought us out into the desert to starve this entire assembly to death. Notice the words here. They're depressed, disillusioned, discouraged. They're they're longing to go back to what they know. They're longing for Egypt. If I could think of a modern illustration, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Meet the Robinsons. Uh, It's a uh, movie that came out mid-2000s, I believe. and It's a movie about a uh, kid gets a time machine, uh, goes into the future, and the bad guy uh, is trying to stop him. And to stop him, he brings a T-Rex back from dinosaur times. And he has a mind control device on the dinosaur. And, and he's trying to get the kid, and, and the kid goes into a corner, and the dinosaur is trying to grab him with its little arms. And he says, I got a big head with little arms. Master, I don't think you thought this plan all the way through. And <laughs> that's what I kind of think the Israelites are thinking here. Like, God, you haven't thought this all the way through. You haven't thought about how this works. There's, t- there's so many of us. How are you going to feed us? <laughs> isn't that a silly question to ask God? How are you going to feed us? But this isn't a failed plan in the desert. Rather, it's a thorough testing of the Israelites. Exodus 16.4 says, And the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down the bread. And in the end there he says, In this way I will test them and see whether they will follow my instructions. Whether they will follow. Moses, he explains that these are not grumblings against Moses and Aaron, but against God. They're grumbling against God, not the leaders there. God's provision is being revealed here, and it's a testing of their faith. It is enough for their daily needs for that day, but also enough for the Sabbath. God teaches them that the day that comes where they will not work to find it They're to gather more the day before because God will provide it enough for the next day. Provision, even when they rest. But there's a test involved and it's called obedience. Which brings us to our first point this morning on waiting on God's daily provision. You know, often in our lives, we ask the question, you know, who provides for you? I mean, you have to fill out your tax forms, almost April 15th here. And it says, you know, who is the head of the household or who is uh, the providers in this place? And often in our minds, we look to ourselves and we say, I am provider. I am the one who gives provision. But here in Exodus, we're seeing that we're supposed to wait on God's daily provision. You know, if it's other than God that's providing for you, we're making that object, that person, or even ourselves, God. You know, the Israelites, they were slowly turning from God being the one who provided for them. You know, what was providing for them before was what they were starting to turn back towards, trying to move back towards Egypt. But God, he's using his provision to turn their eyes back towards him. Back towards his provision. 
But even more today we have to think about, we don't have manna that we're eating in the desert, which I'm kind of thankful um, sometimes. You know, maybe if it was really good, I guess it would be, I, yeah, if it's God providing, it should be good, good bread. Uh, but in our context, what is God's daily bread that he's giving us? I believe it's the nourishing relationship we have with the living God. The relationship that we have through Him. And we have this relationship with God through our prayer life. A life that is dedicated to communicating with God. Knowing Him personally. By speaking to Him. But also, it's through the Word. This Word is the way that God gives us the bread of life. His words of life. And we're going to talk about John 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life later. But also, in nourishing this relationship with the living God, this daily bread that we have, it's a relationship with a God who has relationship within Himself, the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not everyone understands that God is one. But He is in three persons. The Father and the Son have a relationship. The Holy Spirit has a relationship with the Father and the Son. In that way, we are in relationship with a God who exemplifies relationship. It's also nourishing our relationship with the living God through worship. What we did this morning, we worship, we praise Him, we declare His name above other names. When we sing, we are proclaiming it through our voice. Through statements, we can proclaim Him. But also, we are nourished in relationship with the living God through gatherings. Through God-centered gatherings where we encounter the living God with each other. In community. These first-hand experiences. You know, the Lord's Prayer says, give us our daily bread. And I wonder if often we think of daily bread as the physical food we receive, but God wants to give you a spiritual nourishment. And the question comes, when do we consume this daily bread, this spiritual bread? We can consume it in our homes. Through, often uh, I find myself, uh, I have to find a quiet place in my home. It doesn't happen often. Uh, but you, you find a quiet place and you know, the usual standard is you, you get your coffee, you get your devotional book, you get your Bible, you get those all together, and you can be nourished there until a child comes screaming into the room. Uh, but when we consume it, where we consume it, it can be in our homes. God meets with us in our homes. God also can meet with you in your car as you're driving around, as you're working in your office. God can meet with us on our phones sometimes. Sometimes it's knowledge that we're given through his word that we have read on a device. That often I like a place where we find God with each other, where we consume this daily, daily bread is around tables. And it's not just the tables where we eat physical bread, it's the tables where we meet with other believers or meet with non-believers and share the bread of life with them. Showing them this word. Revealing it to them. And showing them it matters. But there's a question here. Why do we really need this bread? Why do we really need it? And why in this way? Why is God giving it in this way. You know, Exodus 16.20, we didn't read this, but this is ahead. It says, however, some of them paid no attention to Moses. They kept part of it until morning. But it was full of maggots and began to smell. So Moses was angry with them. You know, there's something we have to recognize here is that living on our own provision sickens us. They were trying to live on their own provision and, and gather more when they shouldn't have been. And it got moldy. It sickened them. God was testing their obedience. God often tests us to see 
who you truly rely on. And often when we rely on our own provision, it's going to sicken us. Also, the reason why we really need it this way, the bread to be provided this way, is that waiting was not the goal. You know, waiting is not the goal of waiting on God's daily provision. The goal that God was trying to do was it was helping a people become a Yahweh-reliant people instead of a self-sufficient or Egyptian-dependent people. It was changing their alliance. How is God testing you today? Where is he changing your mind to see how you need to wait on his provision, to rely on his provision? But secondly, that leads to our second point this morning, that pain distracts from God's truthful provision. You know, our, our daily pains and grumblings can, can put enmity between us and God. You know, we can say, well, God defeated the Egyptians, but what about defeating my hunger pains? What about my thirst? Pain is like this constant reminder that the world is not as it should be. Injustice exists. Evil exists. Enemies exist. And sometimes, look at the serpent in the garden as the one who offered us true freedom. That's what pain can distract us to say. Sometimes we can look at his deceiving words and that God is a liar. That God is not who he said he is. That you can find out for yourself and you can be like God. You can be self-sufficient. And when we rely on these words, then we start to believe if that's true, then it means God is a bully. That he is the one who inflicts pain. And this is the problem of relative truth. Of believing truth on our own, out of our own mind. Because if God is a liar, then all truth is self-authored. It's authored out of who we are. And we call this self-actualization or, or enlightenment by our power is the only way to find the truth. But self-actualization then is making our bitter-tasting bread that never satisfies. Because we're making it out of our own mind. I like to think of self-actualization as like this flat bread. Like we can't make anything out of it. It's our own knowledge. There's often no taste, no texture. It's bland, meaningless. Because if I am my own creator, then I am a terrible creator <laughs> who destroys everything I touch because sin is rampant. Sin means there is no good in me without God moving. When we rebelled in the garden, we took on the role of baker, of our own provision and source of truth. And we live in a world full of people's flat bread <laughs> that they're trying to offer as truth, that they offer as the source of truth. People with their flat bread that says, this flat bread tastes better than your flat bread. But what they're looking for is the living bread. The words of life. When it's flat bread is held up to this living bread of life, it shows the false narrative that this bread is giving, that's deceiving us into believing. Throw out the world's bread and pick up the bread of life, the bread that does not leave you empty. It fills you up with eternal life that starts now and lasts forever. Because what happens is, number three here, is that grumbling grows into mass groaning. You know, something interesting about this passage here, and I'd love to to go into this next passage that we'll read a little bit from, but this is not the only time that Israel grumbles. But there's, a, there's like a, I don't know what you call it, uh, a re, uh, there's a sequel. That's what it is. It's a sequel. It's like, uh, you know, Star Wars 1, Star Wars 2. Here's, here's the sequel uh, for, for the book of Exodus is Numbers 11. If you've ever read Numbers 11, take some time to read it this week because in this, the same, almost the same sounding story comes up. They begin grumbling in the desert again. The, let's, let's turn there to Numbers 11 and see this. 
because we're going to read a couple verses from here. Numbers 11, 4 through 6. The rabble with them began to crave other food, and again the Israelites started wailing and said, if only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we ate in Egypt at no cost. Also the cucumbers, melons, leeks, onions, and garlic. But now we have lost our appetite. We never see anything but this manna. Here it is later. Later years going on. And they're struggling. And this groaning has now turned into mass grumbling. And God in this passage here becomes even more frustrated with them. This constant grumbling eventually turns into this community self-destroyer. The constant groaning against how God was working through manna turns into this mass groaning of, God, we don't like how you are leading us. Take us back to Egypt. Take us back. In this passage in Numbers 11, God blows a mass amount of quail into the camp. And it says... it. it says it was so deep, it was, it was two cubits deep. So everybody have their cubit, cubit measuring tape? Everyone got theirs to pull out? It was three feet deep all the way around the camp of quail. You know, that's a lot of, you know, a lot of chicken. Um, makes the snow look appealing this past week. You imagine the smell that's happening in that community. The disgust that's happening in that community. Our grumbling has a smell of disgust that reaches up towards God. It's like looking at Pepe Le Pew, the skunk. The stink lines coming off us to heaven. When we start grumbling towards God's lean, the stink is this grumbling rising. The stink grows so strong that no one wants to gather around us. No one wants to be around us. When it happens in churches, no one wants to be a part of a stinky church. God also doesn't bless a stinky church until we turn back to him and become reliant on his provision again. The Israelites, it takes them 40 years in the desert to finally go into the promised land. But I think it's because there was a stink there and they're grumbling God forbid we ever become a church with a stink in us that reaches into our community, where it reaches into our relationships with one another, where it's more known about our will being done than God's will being done. We must trust our, um, we, when we trust our own provision rather than God's provision, we have a smell. And God wants to move in us. To make us holy. You know, the reality is perhaps you need to repent of any attitudes in you that are hindering you in your relationship with God, that are hindering the beautiful bride of Christ. You know, we are not a nation. This church is not a nation, but scriptures describe the church as a bride that is being made holy, where our blemishes are washed away. That every day we see how we are being made new. And one day all of our grumblings and groanings, they will be washed away. When Jesus returns, the pains of our life will be like pieces of sand washed away. We'll see how minuscule they truly are in comparison to eternity. Our beauty will be revealed and we will say to Christ, you are holy. You are the one that no one is like. He will wipe away our tears and say, well done, good and faithful servant. But it's because of Jesus. And that leads into our last point, that Jesus is our provision in empty deserts. You know, when Jesus is tested in the wilderness in Luke Chapter 4, verse 4. He says this. The first thing that Satan tempts him with is bread. 
If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Be your own provision. Be your own God. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, which actually was a recalling to Deuteronomy 8.3. After all the waiting in the desert, and the Israelites are about to go into the promised land, Moses reminds them, God is your provision. Don't live on bread alone, but live on God's provision. You know, the temptation Jesus went through in the wilderness was painful. It was painful, but he didn't let that pain define him. You know, fasting, it's not an easy practice, but when Jesus responds to temptation, he recognized who he is truly reliant on, the Father, the Creator. Jesus, he even tests his own disciples with this bread question. Philip in, in John chapter 6, verses 5 through 6, just when, they're about, when he's about to feed the 5,000, he asks this question of Philip. John chapter 6, 5 through 6. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy by bread for these people to eat? It's the same question that's happening in Exodus. How, who is going to provide for you? Who is going to provide for you? And, and Philip responds, he says, it would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread. Philip, you got it wrong. <laughs> Jesus is going to provide. He is the provider. And right after this comes the teaching on the bread of life in John chapter 6, verses 32 through 35. If you look there, let's look there. Open your Bibles, John chapter 6, 32 through 35. Jesus says this. This is where we're heading towards right now. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. And then Jesus declared, I am am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus is telling them, I am the bread. Jesus is the one we are relying on. The story of provision always points to Jesus. Jesus wants to give us eternal life today. In our empty, unsatisfying deserts of this world, Jesus wants to satisfy you with daily bread through his words, through believing in his name. Jesus is drawing you to him, so stop grumbling. John 6, 43, right after he says this, the Pharisees start grumbling, it says. And Jesus literally says, stop grumbling among yourselves. Jesus answered, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me and I will raise them up at the last day. This is the promise. The promise of his faithfulness, that he gives eternal life. You know, the bread of life is for today, not tomorrow, not when we arrive in heaven. And we're given a double portion on Sundays. Oh, that's the way I look at it. But the modern day Christian also tries to make this a septuple blessing, which means a seven times blessing. <laughs> Trying to live on the crumbs of Sunday's feast throughout the week. It's no wonder we are in darkness stumbling day after day because we're wasting our way on the moldy bread of Sunday rather than receiving the fresh bread that God wants to give us day after day. The fresh bread that God gives you daily is to feed your soul, to prevent any grumblings in your spirit against him. Throughout the week, we must keep looking for the fresh bread that God offers through his word, through Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Because the reality is I'm not coming knocking on your door and providing bread for you this week. The pastor isn't going to come knocking on your door every morning to break open the bread of life for you and say, this is exactly what Jesus wants you to hear this morning. 
I can't be everywhere. I am not provider. God is provider. Sunday is like a five-course dinner on the bread of life. You know? And then you have your, your YouTube pastor you can go to and you can have sometimes cheap words at no cost to truly rely on a God encounter throughout the week. If you're living on a fast food diet, a fast food spiritual diet, only eating at the pastor's drive through kitchen, then guess where you're going to end up? Sick. In a spiritual hospital. In need of true nourishment. If you aren't getting fed enough, you need to find the bread of life. You know, there's some great French fry sermons out there. Well, I like to call them French fry sermons out there that are just giving us a good taste of things to come. Like, uh, you know, you can dip them in ketchup with your small groups like house churches and, and Sunday school classes. But are you being nourished by God's bread of life daily? Daily being provided for. The cross was not so you could have a drive through meal every Sunday only to feel empty and sick the rest of the week. We can't be short-sighted consumers trying to make one provision of bread last the whole week. The pastors, you know, we don't have time to nourish you daily. You know, video teachings, they can't be your only source of spiritual fulfillment. Moses didn't provide the manna. Aaron didn't provide the quail. It was God who provided it. But if we depend on our pastors to be the ones to spiritually nourish us, we're going to go empty. We will start grumbling against one another because, well, the pastor didn't feed me enough today. The pastor didn't do what I like today. And we'll start grumbling against one another because we're not seeking his daily provision. God is giving you the weary Christian in the darkness the prescription today from the scriptures. The manna each day keeps the tempter away. The manna each day keeps the tempter away. The enemy, he wants you to fail. He wants you to languish. He wants to see the church stink. He wants us to get rotten and disgusted with God so we can look as moldy as him. Don't do it. The manna each day keeps the tempter at bay. Jesus, he defeated the tempter. He defeated him. And he wants to give you his good provision. Don't rely on the enemy's words. God is provider. He has provided all you need. So search for your daily bread. Search for God for all your needs because he knows your needs. Don't stop gathering the bread throughout the week thinking that Sunday's meal will last longer than it does. We are not still in Egypt, nor are we eating manna in the desert. We have been given fresh bread each day to eat, to be filled. God's daily provision. The pain, the grumblings, they'll take our eyes off Jesus. They'll take our eyes off of God's provision. But when we turn our eyes back onto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, then our empty deserts become filled with God's living bread again. Let's pray. Father, this morning we thank you that you are our provider. That you are the one that we rely on. That you are the one who is our only provision. We're not going to find it in the desert. We're not going to find it back in Egypt. We're going to find it in you. So Lord, this week I pray that you would bless all of us to help us to daily find your words of life that will fill us that will give us the abundant life that you've promised us. Today, Lord, we ask this. Give us our daily bread and lead us not into temptation. We thank you, Jesus, for the daily bread. We ask that you would be with us as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for the benediction? Now may the bread of life fill you up. May you never go hungry, but always find satisfaction in his every word throughout every day this week. God bless you. You are dismissed.